Hey guys, it's Phil here from The Goose. It is Friday the... I don't even know what the date is. Like 23rd, 4th? 23rd, 24th, something like that. Anyway, um, thanks well, for tuning in last week. We, we did a quick seminar that we ran at the boat show on tuna fishing. And uh, we got a great response, so thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Um, so this is another one we did. This is all about fishing uh, options for a small boat owner on Cape Cod. We developed this a couple of years ago for the boat show. The idea is um, to talk about how you can actually you know, go fishing a relatively small boat. You don't need a big offshore machine to fish in where we're going to talk about. It's aimed really at an introductory level. Um, it's not really aimed at, for, for people who fish the, the bay or, or off Nantucket Sound all the time. Um, but if you're tuning in because you're bored and you fish there a lot, then fair enough. Please feel free to comment during the presentation. Um, Jake's going to try and fire questions for me during it. Happy to answer those. I'm um, also what I'm going to be doing is uh, just keep an eye out at the end of this. We're going to announce a little bit of a, um, a followers and we'll send you some swag kind of a deal for somebody. Um, so shall we uh, pile into it, Jake? Why not? Let's you get after it. You press the button. Oh, you just do it. Boom. So, like we said, it's aimed at small boats. And I kind of like saying 18 foot. It doesn't mean 18 foot. Um, you can't go above 18 foot in these areas. Some of the areas we're going to talk about, the water's pretty skinny actually, so the smaller and the less your boat drafts, i.e. the depth of water it needs to, to operate in, the smaller the better. Um, I really want this to be a family you know, friendly kind of thing, what you can do with your kids. Um, if you haven't really experienced, done a lot of fishing before, um, some of it's really easy, uh, really good fun. Byproduct of it is, uh, especially when, well the supermarkets aren't so bad now, but um, if, you, if you actually want to take something home to eat for dinner, this is a great way of catching some really tasty food. We're going to talk about where to fish, obviously. Where to launch, where can you put your boat in. Um, and some of the techniques and the target species. And like I say, Q&A, but please um, comment as you go. Um, if you like what we're talking about, put a like. If you, you don't like it, sorry dude, clear off. Um, but obviously, yeah, leave any comments. Um, also very keen to see what else you'd like me and the team to talk about. Um, as we're all stuck at home at the moment, I'm more than happy to, to talk about you know, all things fishing really. If I could get the team together, I'd actually do a panel, but there you go. So, let's talk about where to We'll start on the bay side. Um, the bay side, if we start right down here, um, where we're just inside the canal, Barnstable Harbour. Barnstable, it's a kind of one boat in, one boat out job, small parking, but uh, more small parking, a pain in the arse. Um, to brutally honest. It's got some access to some great fishing in there, um, but the slip, especially in July and August, gets incredibly busy. Um, so I would recommend if you're not that experienced in launching and retrieving your boat, I wouldn't really go into Barnstable. But what I'd do is I'd come along to Sussuit in Dennis. You've both got Northside Marina, which is right at the bottom of the um, 134, and then off School Street you've got the, the big public lot few years ago they did a massive project there and they created a huge car park uh, multiple in and out slips it's a really really easy good deep water place um, to put your boat in and out really safe good water and some fantastic uh, access to whether it be Barnstable, Billingsgate, Brewster Flats which we'll come on to in a minute. Um, just be, be mindful in, in Sussuit if you haven't been there for a while last year rather than have parking attendants they've uh, actually put a parking display um, thing in and, and the harbour masters there are pretty quick to ticket you if you don't actually uh, pay for your tickets. Easy enough, just go to the machine, put your credit card in. I think it's about 15 bucks for a, for a trailer and a boat. Don't get got. Don't get got. Rock Harbour. Um, there's a small public ramp there. Um, it's a gorgeous harbour, Rock Harbour. A very idyllic, um, kind of very rich in the culture of Cape Cod, mainly because it's incredibly tidal. So you go a couple of hours either side of low water. If you've ever been to the Orleans side and watched the boats, you'll see the entire fishing fleet go out on the tide almost in a procession. And then four hours, five hours later, when they're coming back at the end of the chat, they all pile in again. Huge, quick will turn around and go back out. So very fun to watch. Wouldn't necessarily recommend putting your boat in there. Um, um, but you know, like I say, if you're, if you're there only for a few hours and you time it right, great access. And finally, you've got Pamut. Pamut, again, is a, a really lovely harbour up in Truro. Um, it's got good access. Um, you've got good water there. Um, you've got access to some great fishing. 
Um, bear in mind though, for a small boat owner, you tend to be down this end of Cape Cod Bay. So actually being up in Pamut um, is, is a long way from home. It's normally for going up if you, you know, a lot of the tuna guys, and there is some wonderful bass fishing sometimes up here. Um, but you're also getting to some big Atlantic waters up there. So not necessarily somewhere you'd go in a very small boat. Um, and then if we come down to the sound side, you've got Bass River, right at the end, huge car park, great access, literally throw it in. Again, if you, if you haven't really done a lot of launch and retrieval, the current is absolutely ripping through there. Um, so so it's, it can be difficult to, to control your boat if you're not used to it. Um, and finally, a bit like I said about Sussuit really, Sacquatucket in Harwich, wonderful harbour, huge car park, great ramp, it's cheap, it's like 10 bucks or something. Harbour Master's office there are really cool, they're a really nice group of people there. And you're straight into Nantucket Sound. So I think, you know, you've actually got a really, really good launch there for Sacquatucket. And finally, you can get in at Riders Cove, you can get into a couple of other places into Pleasant Bay, but then you've got to run the Chatham Inlet. And in an 18 foot boat, uh, personally, I wouldn't recommend it at all. Unless you're very experienced, the rips that, and tide that comes through um, is, is pretty horrific at times there. Um, so it's you know, for the experienced and uh, those who are not faint of heart. And also the small boat ownership, really, you're focusing on these southern waters anyway, not the bigger waters on the Atlantic up here anyway. So that's a little bit about where to launch. We're just going to do a new flick. All right, so just quickly click around the places in the bay where you can fish, just so you know where we're talking about. Barnstable Harbour, okay, um, huge body of water there. Really cool, in the spring what happens is the stripers, they come through the Cape Cod Canal, they come down here and they actually stage um, inside Barnstable Harbour and they're actually looking to the, targeting the bait fish that get flushed out on the outgoing tide. Fingers is basically due north of there, some deeper water. And you can find them there chasing the sand dunes and things. Um, Brewster Fat Flats is a really cool kind of May, June area. Very shallow, which is why it suits a small boat. You can actually wade out to it, um, depending on the tide. And you can kayak out to it as well. Um, it's a really cool fishery. Me, uh, my son, when, when, when he was younger, we had some wonderful fish in there. And you can catch some absolute slobs in there. And the other nice thing about Brewster Flats, you can actually see the fish because it's so shallow. So you're actually targeting right at them. Kind of due north of there, you can just see this blue on the screen here. This is the Billingsgate Shoals. Actually used to be above water at one stage and there used to be a prison on it. Um, that's all gone now. But you can see down here, these edges, um, Billingsgate can be a phenomenal place to fish. As you again, you touch a little bit further north, you've got a place called The Path. To a stretch of deeper water, this is this is Wellfleet Harbour, and it comes out here, um, home of some absolute monster bluefish um, in kind of like August time frame. And again, if you are coming out of Pamut, you got a really cool place of uh, water up here called uh, the Cottages. Um, it's normally calm inside there. It's inside. Uh, you've got Provincetown Harbour there. It's you'll see a row of cottages here, and there's an outflow pipe from one of the ponds there that again is throwing out um, bait fish and the stripers love it. Um, my daughter actually caught her biggest ever striper there, about 18 pounds in there many years ago. And finally you can come round, off, this is kind of coming round to Race Point up here, but on the way round you've got Herring Cove, uh, which you'll see there's, uh, there's a place called the Bath Houses and things, and down there the water drops from 18, 20 feet to 180 foot, it's just literally, it's like a shelf. Um, the, the fish stack up against there and the, and the stripers and the bluefish push the bait up the shelf onto the onto the shallow ramp water. Lots of lobster pots along the line, so be very careful there for losing your line, especially if you're using wire line or lead core or any of the trawling. And around here off the race, you can come round on a really calm day. Just be really really careful um, because you're starting to get big water. And there's there's times around here when I've run my boats here coming up to the tuna grounds, and we're going footers through here. It's a really churning in there. It can be a really dangerous place. So don't do it on a small boat. No. Um, that's the kind of like where to fish in the bay. And if we look at now on the on the southern side, we're predominantly looking at Nantucket Sound. I'm sorry for people that are, are watching and they want to go all the way down into um, Buzzards Bay, which is this lovely body of water here. Um, I talk about it, I just don't know that much about it. I'm sorry, I don't fish it very often. Uh, what I would say is 
reach out to a guy called Ryan Collins who runs My Fishing Cape Cod. Um, we're big partners. He fishes that all the time. He lives down in Bourne. He knows all about that. And there's, there's wonderful forums and blogs on myfishing myfishingcapecod.com. And Ryan has some tutorials about fishing in there specifically and further down the found and stuff. So that aside, if we start the, the, the school reef, if you come out of Sacquatucket, which is just here, you basically come out like 500 yards, a little bit to the here and created an artificial reef. It was incredible. In, inside like 30 days, you could start to see scup and juvenile sea bass on it. Now what's happened, the, 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 the sea bass and the scup now are really uh, settled in and you get really good fishing. And like I say, you could kayak there. You know, it is like four, 600 yards off the beach. The, the old one that, that's kind of like slowly eroding, albeit they've put some more debris on this year, or last over the winter, is the tire reef, which is like you're coming out of um, Bass River now, it's just down there. Uh, it's about three quarters of a mile out. Um, great fishing. It was created by tires, spookily enough, called the tire reef. Um, and the further you go west, as you get to Bishop St. Clerk, Bishop St. Clerk, you'll see a little lighthouse there. Be really careful around there. There's some, it does. Offshore, there's some rocks that get exposed at low water. Um, what I would say around there, great place to live line scuff and things for, for um, stripers. Um, but also, if you keep moving further west, you get off the deeper water, off of Hyannis, you get some really good sea bass fishing with some absolute monsters. I think a five pound sea bass, which are incredible to catch, they're great fun. Um, and then finally, like I say, just to be careful, as you come around, this is a bit of an older map because it doesn't sew the whole as monomoy is solid. But as you come around, um, you ha have <clears throat> she's stone horse shoals down here and as you come up towards Chatham, kind of where the fish is, um, albeit on the inside a bit, you've got Bursa's shoals. Um, some wonderful fish fishing there, um, especially for the striped bass. They're chasing the squid, the pogies, the sand eels, the everything through there. And you can fish the flat water there and also the rips. Bear in mind, you know, it is a shoal, it is rips. The, if the, if the wind and the tide are going different uh, directions, it can really um, get choppy in there. So just be really careful. But on some days, like I say, some days you can kayak it. Some days you won't take an ocean going liner through it. You know, you just look at the day and make your choice based on the conditions. And bear in mind, you can always go fishing another day. Um, word of advice. So it's kind of like a where to fish. So what if, excuse me, drink break. Last year, last week I had beer, I've only got water today. So, a little, little sip. Let's look at the species. Striped bass, iconic. Um, changing the regulations this year, but I'll go on to that in a minute. Um, great fun fish to catch. Um, then we've got you know the black sea bass. Beautiful looking fish. Very accommodating. Pretty easy to catch when they're in season. They look gorgeous. They taste divine. Everything everything is wonderful about them. Apart from they've got some pretty nice little spikes on their gills, and they are quite spiky. And they're pretty, but they're wonderful fish. Um, the flounder, we get the winter flounder, uh, we get the black black flounder, we get the summer flounder or the fluke. And again, wonderful eating fish, great sporting fish. And you can catch those both in the bay and um, in Nantucket Sound. Blue fish, one of my personal favourites. Um, you know, pound for pound, one of the toughest fighting fish eater is out there. It's a really cool fish. It can be very accommodating. Bear in mind it has razor sharp teeth, and, you know, 14 pound bluefish could probably take your finger clean off. So just be careful with it, you know, it's just like dealing with a pike or something if you're freshwater fish. And finally the scup. Um, scup, relatively small, tastes great, not a lot of meat on them. Um, I tend to catch them as a byproduct of, of catching sea bass. Um, and what we're now going to do, Joe, is kind of like talk about some of the techniques. You know, we've got top water, which is more seasonal, tube and worm, live lining, vertical jigging. So let's try and do this by species really to, to talk about some of the techniques and I've got some example laws to show you. Okay, striped bass. And you see on the map, like I say, is they, they, they're they migrating at the moment. If you go on to onthewater.com, um, on the water runs a really cool um, tracking mechanism sponsored by Yeti. You can actually follow the migration of the striped bass as they're coming up the coast. They're off Rhode Island, I think, at the moment. And they're going to come up. Some are going to come right round now, took it sound, and they're going to come round Chatham. Um, a lot of them are going to come into. Um, um, oh, excuse me, my brain's gone. They're, they're, they're going to come into Buzzards Bay, excuse me, and then they're going to come through the canal and they're going to come down. Okay? 
in the spring, kind of like mid to late May, think it's going to be earlier this year because the, with the mild weather, the sea temperatures are warmer. Um, as of last week, the herring are starting to run pretty thick on the Cape now. So, you know, th those are really key indicators. I haven't seen any ospreys yet in Orleans, but that's going to come. Um, so I think that, you know, everything's coming a little bit early. Um, but late May through June, Barnstable Harbour is one of the first places we'll fish. Um, then we'll, they migrate out to the fingers. Um, you also get an early run, like I said, with these fish that come south um, through Nantucket Sound. They don't tend to live in Nantucket Sound, they're kind of migrating through. You will find them there, but the bigger fish tend to come round to the colder water in Chatham. Um, Brewster Flats, you know, they're going to be up here on the flats. Um, and the lures you're going to use, we, we use in the spring, we use a lot of small stuff um, and a lot of top water. The fish are pushing the sand eels predominantly up onto the surface. Um, you get some wonderful surface blitzes going on. You'll see the birds, you'll see the fish crashing and slopping around. The stuff we're using is, is smaller. So things like this, this is the, you know, the head and spook, just walking the dog on top. Um, personal favorite of mine is the dart spin um, from Hyperelastics. This one's actually rigged weedless, but it's nice and light. It's got a little weight in it. Um, I was catching about 30 schoolies a day um, with this last year. It's really cool, easy to use lure. Um, another favorite is the Savage Gear. Very popular for the smaller fish in the spring. Um, and then you can use smaller boats. You know, this is the Dart Wing by Nomad. Um, this well, it's not so much that we'll come back to that one. Uh, we're in the, like I say, smaller lures, first top water. Then you've also got the classics. This is the dock. Hey now. This is the dock. Um, Daddy Mac Lures has one called the RD Bomb. Uh, very similar, big heavy spook, walking the dog. Hilarious to fish because the fish absolutely crunch these. Um, especially the bigger fish. If you are going bigger fish fishing, I recommend you change the um, the split rings because they're not really heavy enough. Um, but isn't that really cool? And that's on the, you know, the top water stuff. You can also use a wake bait. So this is Sabeel Magic Swimmer. Um, you can see it's heavily jointed. So literally just a cast and retrieve. And then SP Minnow, not quite on the top, but another classic wobbling bait. What we tend to do is we put an extra split ring on here, go up a size on the treble and take the back treble off. If you can, especially when you're chasing schoolies, um, one of the reasons I really love the dart wing, as you can see, it's got single hooks in it. Um, same with the, uh, the dart spin, these single hooks much better for the smaller fish rather than trebles. But you're gonna catch them on top. So look for the, um, look for the fish moving um, and, and you look for the birds and get onto those uh, surface fishing. It's probably the best fishing you can get in my opinion that's um, a fact it's a fact it's a fact and then you know that's all that this is more spring but you do you do, you do get them breaking in you know july and august i fished with patrick Seville in august this year i think and we had surface feeds and it depends where the bait are um sometimes what they'll do is they'll push the bait up onto the shallow water on places like billingsgate shoals but as the water warms up especially in cape cod bay um the stripers tend to either go for the deeper water or they're gonna go round the corner, round Provincetown, and away, okay? And a couple of years ago, they actually stayed in the canal, which for the guys fishing the canal loved it. It was an incredible year there. But in that deeper water, you've got to change your technique. So you can look at vertical jigging. So vertical jigging for me, this is a classic. This is one we actually had made for us at the store uh, with a much stronger mustard hook. It's called the Ava Jig. This is an 07. They come in up, all the way up 17, 27, 37, 47. Um, and this is just you know jigged, jigged up, and it dances around to look like a sand eel. Um, deadly dicks are great for that. A couple of years ago, um, Nomad Design brought the streaker out. Um, low profile, very narrow profile jig, sand eel pattern, deadly. And you can use the butterfly jigs when you're jigging it up and down with it. Yeah, that's the flat sider from from uh, Schwano. So you've got a lot of things you can do on the vertical jig, but also what I'd say is. As that water gets warmer, you've got to change your techniques. And what you have to start looking to do is maybe you're going to use lead core line, which is a rig like this, Jay. Ooh. So this is lead core. So we're a conventional reel. We're um, with a lead core line, so a braided line, which actually has a core of multicolored. And then you're fishing 
A nice way of doing it is to fish something like this. This is called a, a tube, slightly weighted tube by ANS. And what you do is you put a sea worm on the end of it and you troll this very slowly, so two to three knots, and it slowly turns and the striped bass love it. Um, it's a great lure to use, especially if the people on your boat aren't experienced because you can just grab the tube, pull the fish out of the water. Um, so you, and you haven't got any treble hooks on it. Um, the other thing to do is if, if the fish are very in the deep, you know, really in the deep water, is to actually wire line jig. So this is what we have made. A friend of ours, um, Tim, makes these. It's a lead head, basically a huge bucktail. And you fish this with a slight mono leader, the same reel pretty much as what I showed you with the lead core, but you're using 100 yards of wire first with a Dacron backing. The benefit of that is what's going to happen is it's going to bounce on the bottom and it's going to look like a wounded bait fish coming out of the water. And you'll see people on sat on the boats looking backwards, jerking the rod back. And what they're doing is they're scuffing this out of the water. Or you'll see people with a glove on or something and they're what's called snapping wire. And you'll hear that as a term. Um, can be formidable in the, in the heat of the summer. So I'm giving you there a couple of, you know, we've looked at some of the early top water lures uh, classic pencils, classic you know, poppers, through the dock and everything. And then we're actually looking at the deeper water, vertical jigging, and um, <clears throat> tube and worm and the wire line. Okay, the regs on striped bass, they changed this year recreationally, guys. Yeah, they've made a slot limit now, so you're, you're allowed to keep one fish over 28, in, uh, 28 or more uh, and under 35. So 34 and 15 16 is fine, but you cannot keep a 35 inch fish anymore. So please put them back responsibly. Um, one word of caution, uh, especially in Cape Cod Bay, there's um, a fair proportion of great white sharks now. Um, I won't be too worried about them. They're quite majestic to look at. Um, they'll quite happily swim past your boat. Jaws is actually a fiction. Um, but I won't go sticking your hand in the water to retrieve your, uh, your striped bass that you've been fighting for 10 minutes. Because obviously, as you can imagine, a striped bass, when it's being caught, is giving off all sorts of electrical signals of distress, etc. And the sharks pick up on that. And a number of uh, charter captains and recreational anglers in the last couple of years have caught some incredible footage of uh, striped bass getting taken near the boat by great whites. What I recommend is use a net. Do not use a gaff. Gaffs suck. They're for tuna. Um, you don't need them for striped bass. I wouldn't really go there. We don't, we hate gaff so much. I don't think I've even got a sticker to this. No, I see one over there. I think the sticker, look at that. Yeah. You can come into the goose somewhere and get a sticker. Sammy the striper says, lose the gaff, they suck. Get a net. If a, if a great white takes it, you lose your net. Cost you a hundred bucks. Hopefully you got it on video. You've got a wonderful story. You have all your fingers intact. So no thumbing them now. Use a net. It's a really responsible way for yourself. Um, but also it's a great way of looking after the fish. It's way better than any other method of bringing a fish into your boat, especially when you're only allowed to keep one in the slot. Keep a tape measure handy. Um, we sell them like a buck a piece or something. Um, 48 inch, you can just quickly measure it. Um, Towboat US normally have a load of them in the store. Um, it's actually a sticky tape that you can actually stake to, to uh, put it on along your gun or so you can quickly measure something and throw the fish back. So lots of ways of doing it. Um, Conscious I've rambled on a bit, which is why Jake's moved the slide onto Scup and Seabass. Bastard. I'm anyway, about there. So that's a bit on stripers. Um, what I would say for most of the, what the fishing we've done now is light tackle. You know, this is the, the back bay from Daiwa. Ooh wee. Glor it's a really cool little reel actually. Um, really took the market by storm. Here's the, uh, the competitor. Is the Shimano Stratic. It's actually a 5K, but you don't really need to go much bigger than this. If you start throwing the really big lures, and you've got this, it's the spin fisher combo. So your big nine great. inch ducks. Um, and I was going to talk about on your sea bass, sea bass don't get huge. So this is all I use Mighty Fish Rod. This is an effect. As you can see on the floor, Joe, really nice bend to it, um, really soft. You can make a five pound. Uh, sea bass feel like an absolute pig with that um, and we lifted there's a video going back way back on our instagram we lifted a 10 pound weight clean off the floor with that rod so it's really got some some spine to it but it's got a lot of fun so you don't need to go massively heavy that's what i'm saying for all of this fishing i'm um, just match it you know don't go casting a like this is uh, well, this is a floating version the super long distance 
Oceanborn is five and a half ounces. I wouldn't necessarily cast that with that. So big bait. Yeah, it's a big bait, big fish. Anyway, sea bass. Um, great fun. Really cool for families because it's so damned easy to do. Um, they taste incredible as well. Um, June, July are the best months, in my opinion. Um, starts middle of May, I think, the season. Um, they're really easy to catch. All you need to do is you need to get yourself out to the school reef. Tar reef's disappeared, but it's there. So I don't know where that's going on the slide. Bishop's and Cloak, maybe, and like I say, down to Hyannis if you're going down that way. Um, what I would do is, sorry, just to say, on the, if you're on the bay side, cool. um, there's a rock pile kind of like north, north, about a mile or so out of um, when you come out of, um, that's Barnstable coming out of Sue, it's kind of about here. Um, you'll see yellow and black vertically painted lobster buoys. They're not lobster buoys, they're actually sea bass traps. Got some rough ground there, you can catch sea bass in there, and you can actually catch them up in the target ship up inside Wellfleet. But again, if you're not experienced, I wouldn't necessarily go um, to the target ship because it is actually a ship that was targeted for, by bombers sunk there and, and, the, and the Navy and the Air Force bombed it um, at low tides, especially if you have a big full moon tide, at the low water and um, the, the wreck itself will be exposed. It's all metal, so your fiberglass boat is not going to do too well if it uh, rubs up against it. Mm -hmm. So we've got those areas and you really love vertical jigging. Classic way of doing it is to just have a mighty fish sea bass rig. This one's got three hooks and literally it's, it's three. And what you can do is tie on the bottom something like this. This is a, a, the Gypsy from, from Nomad. Um, or you could actually use one of these flat sided jigs. Um, and what you do is normally just use a bit of squid. Especially if you want to catch scup. Scup really like the squid. Um, but, uh, you know, but if you want the scup, I don't tend to bother so much. Remember that one. Scup um, really like the squid. Really oh, like yeah, the easy squid. to remember. There you go. Um, bear in mind, all you need is little strips of it. You're going to do it all the time. We sell um, some artificial as well, if you don't like the smell of it, which we've got in the store somewhere, uh, which is called gulp baits. The little grubs from uh, gulp do really well as well. What I tend to do, though, is I'll use something like this. This, this is the Ocean Born Bouncing Bucktail. And then what I do from Hyperelastics is I rig this, I should have done it before the presentation really, you just rig one of these on as a tail. Um, and you can do the same, this is the Tsunami jig. They like, yeah, the sea bass like the pink because it's very squiddy. Um, it's really cool. I've actually caught them on some different lures. I've caught them on the Ron Z. Uh, this is the new squid pattern from Bill Hurley, which I think will do well. And what you can do is just like do a bit of a combination, you know, use the sea bass rig I showed you and use one of these on the bottom. So now you can catch four fish at a time. Oh. If you find yourself catching the bigger sea bass, um, what I suggest you do is don't worry, don't bother baiting the hooks, just catch the sea bass one at a time. And if you rig, like I suggested, something like one of these bucktails or this bucktail with, uh, with like a soft plastic, what you're gonna find, your spro works just as well as these, what you're going to find is the um, the scut can't get their teeth around it, so you'll have a lot of false strikes. But when you get when you get taken and you feel your rod bend, you know you're into a decent sized sea bass. So you just whittle the smaller ones out because you can go out there and they're so prolific, which is what makes them so good as a uh, especially for the kids and, and, and experienced anglers. You can catch 50, 100 at a go, okay. But bear in mind, you're only allowed five fish, okay, from the middle of May through September. Um, five fish at 15 inches or more. So you want to get those in your boat first, then go as light as possible and have as much fun. Um, the Daddy, I don't know, Daddy Max actually, but sorry, the Daddy Mac do a really good metal jig that works great as well. So the, the key thing I'd say about the sea bass and the scut, really easy to do. You're nice, if you, especially if you're fishing the school reef and the tire reef, you're only in 20, 30 feet of water. It's not too deep, um, it's, it's pretty easy. Um, you can keep an eye on the tide and the, you know, the winds and stuff and then you, you can easily get back to, to port with your fish. Don't forget to pack a cooler, gut the fish as soon as you can and get them on ice as quick as you can obviously. Try and keep them whole uh, because if you start filleting them on the boat and you get stopped by the environmental police you can't prove they're 15 inches or more but gut them and just to keep them whole and bring them back to shore and then you know, gut them at home and dispose of the, the heads and the tails uh, sensibly. All right. Are you good this time? 
I'm good this time. Oh, go. Summer flounder. Uh, <clears throat> the summer flounder, known as the fluke, they get absolutely massive, um, but they they kind of like you know, when I say massive, like 10, 12 pounds, even 15 pounds, tend to be in the Nantucket rips in the shoals down there, which is a bit too far and not an area for this presentation. But you can get them just off Skakit Beach, and there's a mud as as you come off Skakit, which is right near Rock Harbour. You can actually get in there and you'll see it drops off slightly and it's quite muddy there. And off of some of the areas in Billingsgate, you come across mussel beds. Keep an eye out if you see somebody mussling there. And fishing you know, off the mussel beds is a great place to do it. And interesting off Bass River, everybody charges out to the, um, to the school reef there. If you stop halfway, there's a nice gully. You can actually get some really good fluke fishing in there. So it's worth a try. Um, fluke love sea worms and they love squid best two baits you can use. They have a bit of an addiction for the color yellow as well. To a point that we run a relatively simple rig, something like this, for the fluke and the flounders. And it's got a little spin attraction to it. We'll bait that with, you can use clam, squid, I tend to use sea worms. Um, what I do is I put a little weight on that, two ounce, and we even spray paint the weights yellow um, at the goose, because they're really addicted to that, it really draws them in. I never caught one on a weight, but you never know. So that's a great way. I've had another one somewhere. Uh, oh yeah, this kind of like, um, just a fluke rig with a bead in it. Uh, really simple. This one's more rigging for sand deal than anything else. Well, they love the sea worms. And all you're gonna do is you're gonna let your weight touch the bottom, and then you're gonna let your boat drift. And you literally, all you wanna do is keep your line touching the bottom, okay, as you drift. If you start drifting too fast, like you know, five knots or something, you're gonna struggle. But in that one to two knots, you can actually do okay. For bigger fish, use big strips of squid. Um, a friend of mine, Jimmy, he actually uh, he actually uses whole squids, a long leader, so like maybe a two yard leader, and that allows it to flutter up. The weight's on the bottom, the weight, the squid's floating up. And well, as you drift, you go over the undulations uh, of the seabed, and the the fluke is sitting behind, looking up the slope. And as bait fish comes over the top, they attack. So you're really emulating that. Um, the spinners and the tracks talked about this May through October, 17 inch, five fish. Okay, so remember that measuring tape I told you about earlier is really important. That's the flute. Let's talk about the bluefish. Again, oh, yeah. phenomenal fish, hugely aggressive, very, very, very um, aggressive when they get going. They turn. They turn up in the bay normally as the water is starting to get warmer. Okay, so kind of like J July and August. Last couple of years, we haven't seen them so much, which is a shame. Um, I, in my opinion, they're one of the hardest fighting fish in the sea. Um, they can be really easy to catch, actually, because they're so damned aggressive. Uh, a good fact on bluefish is they're the only species of fish that will actually puke its dinner up so it can carry on feeding. So in these frenzies, they're regurgitating as they go because they just want to feed, they're that aggressive. So if you catch them when they're on a the feed, it's phenomenal. Um, they actually taste pretty good. I'm being English, I love them. Um, they're a bit oily. I recommend if you catch one, you're gonna keep it. The smaller ones taste better than the big ones. Gut them or bleed them as quick as you possibly can. Let them bleed out, then gut them, and then get them on ice. Those are three key things. So bleed them, gut them, ice them. Okay, um, my wife actually um, cold smokes them as in the winter and make pate out of it. It's absolutely gorgeous, keeps us going all winter. Um, but you gotta look after them. If you don't, they're very oily fish, they'll deteriorate very quickly on your deck and then they're just dog meat basically. Um, you can catch them all over the place. They're very predatory, they'll be chasing, they chase the mackerel, the pogies, the sand eels, the everything. Keep an eye out for hard working birds. So you're not looking for birds that are just flying somewhere, you're looking for birds in a vortex, spinning round, and because they're coming down on the fish, because the bluefish are pushing the bait up, and they crash it, and one of the things that bluefish does, compared to a striped bass, for example, striped bass, predominantly eat their prey whole. Bluefish take chunks out of it. I don't know if you have a live line, you've actually find yourself that you've got a big chunk taken out the back of a pogey or something, and that's bluefish. And once they've had a chunk and killed it, they don't tend to bother. Uh, one technique to do is actually, if you see a big pile of bluefish feeding, is to put a dead fish out as a live line. And if you fish under the, um, 
the, the, the bluefish, sometimes you'll actually find quite big striped bass because they're just lazy and they're just waiting for the dead fish to, to come down to the bottom. Um, they fish so aggressively you can actually smell them feeding. You can actually smell the sandy laurel, the povial, the mackerel. You can also see a slick on the water sometimes. And if you see that, you just know you're in there. Even if you just see birds drifting around, um, you're actually in the zone. And then what I would say is the path is, you find them everywhere. Billingsgate's epic, but the path is where the really big ones are. I don't quite know why, but they, they don't tend to do that. Um, and in Nantucket Sound, they blitz all over the place. Um, it, it's like Albie fishing. They're up, they're up somewhere for 30 seconds. They're 200 yards down up for 30 seconds. They tend to be small in Nantucket Sound. We actually, you know, me and the guys, we catch them. We use them for bait when we're tuna fishing. Um, but again, they're, they're really accommodating. Um, you, you need a faster bait or boat to chase them, or you need to be patient to wait for them to come through you. But there's pods of them charging all over Nantucket Sound. Okay, our next slide is techniques, I think. Okay, so during the surface fringes you get, you want a big, big, solid plastic bait. I like simple ones, really. Yeah, this is tsunami. Again, nice thing about this with the tsunami, it's a wooden one, so it's going to get chewed up, but it's got a single hook on it, so you can easily get the fish out. Um, this is the Chug Norris um, from Nomad. Notice again, single hook. Good. Um, the, the other poppers will work fine, don't get me wrong, you'll catch anything on the top. Um, Ron Z is a wonderful bait, lasts about 30 seconds in a bluefish feed, uh, which is good for business, but I suggest you don't if there's a, there's a ton of bluefish around. And then what you can also do is you can skip some of the metal lures across the surface. So this is one of the tsunamis, um, very similar to a Castmaster. We have Castmasters in stock. This has a treble on it. Um, Another one, this is a hammered spoon by a company called Hopkins. It's great because you've got a whopping great um, hook in it, single hook, long lure. You can actually jig this up and down, but you can also cast it a country mile and you just bounce it across the surface. And you have great fun because the, the, sorry, the, the bluefish are probably going to hit this five or six times before they actually get hooked up. So it's really good fun and exhilarating. Probably use something like the spin fisher rod, just because it's a little bit heavier. But yeah, and, and sorry, the other things are again you're not skipping the deadly dick. You know, we talked about it earlier, it's a great sea bass law. Phenomenal low profile law, cast a mile. Um, you can actually use that for for bluefish uh, both vertically and obviously uh, casting to it. When deeper, you can lose lead core, um, like we talked about. And I tend to use the um, you've got the SP minnows, like this will do it, the bomber, these are very iconic um, lure for doing that. Big diving lures, Nomad do them. Plenty of people do the diving lures. Um, they're good. What I would say is use heavy fluorocarbon as a leader, okay? Don't go fishing with like 20 pound test leader because you're gonna lose a lot of gear. Go with like 60 pound test fluoro. But I tend to fish fluoro rather than wire. And I do that because if you actually fish wire line, great, it's not gonna cut it. But what you're gonna find is the wire line um, actually spooks the striped bass. Striped bass won't take it, whereas if you're on fluoro, you might catch stripers. And it's very, very common for both the striped bass and the bluefish swimming together in the same school. Um, Jake and I last year, we were messing around off the race and we didn't know what we were gonna catch next. It was great fun. It was literally one after the other, after the other of different types of fish. Um, there's no minimum size. It's 10 fish a day. I would say if you're going to be cold smoking them for over the winter to make pate and stuff out, big ones are fine. If not, those three to five pounders, they, they, they taste a lot sweeter, they're much more, more fun. But again, really accommodating, really easy to catch, so your kids are going to have a field day with it. I think that's that. So that's enough of me rambling on for 40 minutes. Um, that's an introduction to fishing on Cape Cod for a small boat owner. Hope you enjoyed it. And what I would say is follow us on Facebook, follow us on uh, Instagram. Every week during the season, we, we actually do a video fishing report and we will tell you what's going on where. We have nothing to hide. We want to tell you what's working, where you can fish to make sure you have a great trip when you get on the water. Um, and finally, follow us now on, on Instagram. Um, over this weekend, we're going to be launching a, uh, uh, 
a, a little bit of a uh, you know, followers and get some free swag. Some of it you see on the table here, okay? Have you got any questions? Do we get any questions, Jake? We got a couple questions back couple here. Questions. We got a couple, good couple. Let's scroll up. Scroll We're scrolling up. up to questions. So we got to get somebody to do a future fly seminar on. Hold on, I gotta open this one. Do a future fly seminar on fly fishing for shorebound anglers waiting on the outer cape. Okay, I so get Ian or Eric or Dave to do that. I got three expert fly fishermen on the on the staff, so we'll look to do that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, what size single hook for stripers when removing travel? Depends. You normally have to go a little bit. You want the weight, so you need to go up a size, at least one size on your single, um, to, to to balance against the weight. So I tend to probably go two or three, four, four lots as a hook size. How deep is the water at the Sasuit rock pile? Come on now. Up 30, top. 35. It's not deep. We got to talk about live lining and how to do it properly. Okay. Is no, well, it a seminar or just for striped bass? Could, I mean, we can do it now. I don't know. Striped bass is really easy. Um, it's taken off the last couple of years. Sorry, I should have picked that up. When Billingsgate especially works really well. Race, the off race point, it works really well. Um, Chatham, it works really well in the rips. And basically, it's dead easy. All you need is your, your fluorocarbon to a length of, um, um, sorry, your, your, your braid to a fluorocarbon. And all you do is you, you got it this year if you're live lining, you must have an inline octopus circle hook. Very important. Regulations change. So you can't use your old J hooks or anything. You need an inline circle hook. Uh, and all you do is I tend to rig them through the nostrils because that's kind of habit. And it's cool. When you see mark fish, you toss your mackerel over the side of the boat. Um, there's some specialist reels um, they can get which have a live lining feature. Pen do one, Shimano do the bait runner and the Thunus, which is a gorgeous reel. Um, you can actually just chuck it over and it was quite funny actually, you'll see your line bailing out. Sometimes your mackerel is going to dive, it's going to come nose to nose with stripers and you'll see it shoot straight back up and then you'll see a chase around the surface as the stripers chase them. Um, the nice thing about the live lining reels is you don't need to play with a drag on the top, you just turn the handle and it clicks in. Um, but that's, that's dry, live lining for um, stripers, pretty easy actually, quite a fun way to catch them. You just got to bear in mind you can't have six of you on the boat all live lining because you have no idea where a mackerel are going to go and the chances are they're going to cross lines underneath and you get tangled. You only really can run two or three lines at a time, you've got to make sure they're separated. And of course you've got to get the live mackerel in the first place. Um, you get them actually... Oh, oh I know. There that's fine, leave that, leave that. So if you're gathering mackerel um, you can get them just out here on the red can outside of Barnstable. Um, as you come up here on Sukkotucket, there's the one mile can there. And as you come, well, as you come up here off Herring Cove, the race, race Herring Cove down here, sometimes off this is called Wood End, you'll get the mackerel there. Um, to use for bait, just use a sabiki. Um, all you need is a small sabiki. To get a sabiki de de hooker, and you need a live well with some good running water. And well, while well, we got this one up, launches on the bay side. Yeah, where do we say launch? Go, go back. Yeah, this one, this one, those right. Let's see. Oh, hey, no, oh, hey, no. oh, oh, oh there we look go. at that's a whole slide. So, Boom. where can you launch on the bay side? I don't so much know so much up around the Boston, but you've got Barnstable, not so good. Sasuit, epic. Rock Harbour, okay, but very tidal. Pama, cool. If you're fishing. I personally would say if you're fishing Cape Cod Bay, you really want to be going out to Sasuit. Sure. We also got Wellfleet. Don't forget about Wellfleet. You got Wellfleet. It's just a long way to get to anywhere. It is, it is. Oh, exactly. That's true. I should put Wellfleet in. Come on You've now. got to navigate all the channels out to here. So it's quite long. But you can get some good bluefish inside Wellfleet Harbour to be fair. Any tips on the canal area for stripers and when should we start hitting the canal? Oh, no. I've, well, I've seen pictures of people hitting it now, but I, know, that's was, more, right? I think that's more desperation and uh, trying to will the fish through. Um, what I do there, we're, we're covering this from a boat. Um, what, if you're looking to fish the canal and you want advice, I'd go and see AJ at Red Top um, and the guys down at Cubs. They're coming, though. They'll be here soon enough. That's it. That's it. It's 45 minutes. Um, please like it if you like it. Uh, if you've got any comments, uh, we used a bigger screen this time based on some of the feedback we had last time. We're going to try and do it with a better camera um, next one. 
Um, whoever asked about the, the fly fishing presentation, thank you very much. We will try our best to put one of those on in the next week or two. Any other subjects, please let us know. Uh, follow us. And if you need anything whilst COVID is on, uh, themightyfish.com is our e-commerce website. And we're doing free, free delivery on anything over $30. And we're doing buy four, get one free. If you actually buy any lures, your cheapest lure is free. Lots of other deals. Um, we're trying to answer the phone as much as we can at the store, but just bear in mind we're actually closed because of COVID. Thank you very much for listening. Stay safe, everybody. See you soon. Thanks. So.